And then someone has an experience that of the sacred that is completely um, irrational. It has nothing to do with the way we love our lives to be rationally organized so that we can control everything. A mystical experience takes you from one realm into that which is uncontrollable and you you adjust to the uncontrollable. Hi everyone, it's time for another archetype. Uh, this week I'm going to do the mystic. Um, I have a, a number of suggestions from people that are asking me to do certain mystics, and I will get certain mystics, certain archetypes, and I will get around to every one of them as the weeks go by. Um, I have to think, it's funny how many people are asking me to do the narcissist. I'll get around to that one. Um, but today we're going to do the mystic. And I chose this because of a, a couple of conversations I've had recently where people were describing experiences they were having to me. Uh, describe, and their experiences are what I would call the, the kind of contemporary mysticism. I'm going to define this and then jump into this, but let me just say that I think that more and more people are experiencing something very deep within their being that qualifies as what we could call a contemporary mystical experience. And so I thought it would be, uh, it's time to address that. <clears throat> now, mysticism is the experiential nature of the sacred. So the best way I have found to, to describe the difference between what is a mystical experience and what is not, obviously you're dealing with the sacred and that which cannot be defined, that which is, right? But let's put it on the ground level. This is, I've said to a million women, was there any difference at all between your understanding of what it was like to be a mother before you became a mother when you read books on it and pregnancy and all of this and then actually becoming a mother the experience of becoming a mother was there any difference at all and did your books prepare you in a way that said this is exactly what motherhood's going to be like and this is exactly how my child's going to be and this is exactly how I'm going to raise my child and I'm going to follow the book I have never met a woman, not one, not one, who has said it's exactly like I read. Just exactly like I read. It was exactly like it, smooth as anything. No. Because the way in which we observe something through our mind, the way we imagine it to be, the way we tell ourselves we want it to be, <clears throat> is nothing like what happens to us when we actually experience what we've been studying <clears throat> or what we've been talking about. Um, another way to think about this is when we stay observers in an experience, like the experience of a, a mystical experience, like the nature of God, for example, and we just talk about it and we're we're observing it. We're, we're deciding rationally what we think it is and what we think it isn't and what it could be and what it's not and that there's none of this and there's some of that and there's there's no evil, there's only good, there's no devils, there's only angels, there's blah, 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 how the way how people do things. Because that's how they've organized their universe. That's how they want their universe to be. And then someone has an experience that of the sacred that is completely um, irrational. It has nothing to do with the way we love our lives to be rationally organized so that we can control everything. A mystical experience takes you from one realm into that which is uncontrollable. 
and you, you adjust to the uncontrollable. Like deciding that before you have a child, everything's going to be fine. Your life's not going to change. Your schedule's going to be the same. You're going to be fine. You're going to get eight hours of sleep a night. Everything's going to be fine. And then poof, you actually become a mother and have, a, have to adjust everything, everything about your life, everything around the experience of mothering a newborn child. The, and, and the exhaustion and the, the hours and whatever the demands that particular child has, it all becomes your priority and something you didn't see coming. And that reshapes you. But the element that makes that reshaping okay is the love you feel for that child that was impossible to feel when you're reading a book. When you're reading a book and it says you're going to love your child, you can think, I'm going to imagine what that's like. No, you can't. No, you can't. You can rationalize it. You can talk about it. But you really cannot feel it. You can't feel it until you have that child. And then all these feelings that you didn't even know you had, protectiveness, nurturing, devotion, all of these feelings come rushing up, and now you know what attachment is. Now you know that there is a human being that you would do anything for to keep safe and well. You can't convey that in a book. It's experiential. So the thing, the, the, the jewel I want to give you is that the essence of mysticism is that it is the experience of the sacred in the very same way that we shift from observing parenthood to becoming a parent and how that reshapes us. And, and that experience of mysticism has, I think, through the centuries and certainly now, adapted itself to modernity. So, for example, if we go back to the great mystics, like people like Teresa of Avila, Francis of Assisi, Chavez, whose poetry I'm going to read, by the way. Um, if we go back to a time when the rational mind was not the temple of authority that it is now, when in fact, the world was a more um, religiously driven place. And it was for all kinds of reasons. I mean, science had yet to, to you know, put its claws in people, and um, the rational mind had yet to take over. It was still very largely superstitious. But what it also was was a time when human beings did not doubt that there was something greater than themselves that was the organizing principle of life, that there was something greater than themselves. And that something had authority over them in their everyday life. And lives back then were very short and very painful and very difficult. Um, but doubt had not yet flourished. It hadn't become this organizing principle that it is now in our consciousness. It, it, there was a sense of trust and there was a sense of, um, I, guess, I guess the word would be trust, in, in how the invisible world worked with us. <clears throat> when I look at the writings, for example, of Teresa of Avila, I think, you know, she, she writes sometimes that she was visited by angels. And she doesn't write and then follow that up with, am I going crazy? I must be insane. I must be nuts. I have to go see somebody. No, because for her, the visitation from another realm of angels was ordinary. It was extraordinary, to be sure, but it was ordinary. <clears throat> it was ordinary for her in her world of the sacred to have a sacred messenger. And it did not, she didn't go running through the halls of the convent screaming, oh my God, I've been visited by an angel. It was nothing like that. It was a part of how her world, her universe, her sacred universe functioned. 
In the same way, Francis of Assisi, he heard a voice and it said to him, rebuild my church, Francis. And he took that as a voice of authority describing, and he went about rebuilding a little shack of a church in, in, in Italy, not realizing it was a command to do so much more for the church itself in general. But when these people received guidance like that, their response was that it was the way God talked to them. It was the way heaven spoke, that heaven could send messengers like that, and that these messengers um, were authentic divine voices that were, were bringing in so, uh, something they needed to know. Now, you know, that type of monastic mysticism from which saints have come, I don't think that that is that common anymore. I think that mysticism has adapted itself to who we are today. We are not monastery creatures. We are not um, driven by the same deep religious compulsions that these people had, but we are driven by others that, in my opinion, kind of qualify as a form of the, the way in which we have shifted. For example, one of the most commonly asked questions that I get in my workshops all the time, or comments, has to do with the purpose of life and how many people have said, I wonder for what reason I have been born. For what reason? What reason do I have life? Now, if we roll back and go into history, I can assure you that people in the, today, everyone dwells on that question. But if we roll back several decades, say prior to the nuclear age, prior to World War II, we roll back. This intense inner passion to discover the self by everybody didn't exist. It just didn't exist. This is a phenomenon of our time. This emergence of the inner self is, is something that is unique to who we are of this era. And this need to find meaning and purpose and to question, for what reason have I been born? And I've said to people in my workshops, who, who's supposed to answer that for you? I mean, who, who do you think is going to answer that? Do you think like a FedEx package is going to come in and say, here is your life map? It, who are you asking? Because you're obviously tossing out this profound question, for what reason was I given life? That's when I tell them the truth, that that's not a question, it's a prayer. You're saying, tell me, take me down deep and show me the reasons you gave me this life. What do you want me to do with it? When you ask that question, even in the most desperate of moments, you are actually praying to see a deeper life path that is flanked with sacred assistance so that you feel safe here. Not safe in the way a roof over your head makes you safe. It's a different kind of safe D-net you're looking for. So on that, I'm going to hit a pause button and talk about that. And that's that I, I am not speaking about religion. I, I don't. But I, human nature is something that really I'm pretty familiar with now. And there's common things in us. And one of the common little power zones we have inside of us is this need to feel that we are not wasting our time with our life. 
is to feel significant, is to feel, to put it in mystical language, to hear God call us by name. We are driven by that. Now, it doesn't matter what you call it. It is not a religious compulsion. It is a spiritual one. It is a matter of your spirit to know for what reason have I been born? What am I doing here? And to know now and to know yourself at a level that is beyond your likes and dislikes, but to really know who am I and, and what am I doing here and what have I got to contribute here? These these are prayers. These aren't and, and they get answered. Um, how they get answered is is that in the search for meaning and purpose, in this contemporary mystical quest, I think that the absence of familiarity with our inner spiritual language and our inner spiritual needs are often, to be, and because, because we don't have that language available to us, what I would call holy language, sacred language, the sufferings that we have these days are oftentimes immediately identified as psychological crises, when in fact they're spiritual, when in fact they're a spiritual crisis. The search for meaning and purpose is not a psychological crisis. It's a spiritual one. It's a need to feel, what is it you are looking for? What is it you're looking for? At its core, what a person is looking for is how do I break free of being afraid of myself? How do I break free of my fear of my inner life, of my fear of my intuition? of my fear of deep inner guidance. How do I free myself so that I am liberated to follow the deeper instincts in me that I am feeling so that I, I can truly free myself? It's a spiritual quest. It's a quest for the power of your spirit as opposed to the constraints that you may have put on your life because of circumstances or because of who you think you should be or because of, of um, choices you've made that just don't fit you. That deeper, I think the emergence of us in this, what we call, what I think of as the era of the psyche and the soul, in these last decades, we have completely exploded into the intuitive era, the energy era, the energetics, and we 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 speak about you know our intuition now um, quite commonly. But what is that? What is your intuition? I mean, that whole force in you, that whole capacity in you. It's like an inner metronome that's meant to guide you on do this, do that, do this, listen to this, say this, don't say this. Don't. It's meant to guide you. It is an inner guidance system. And that profound inner guidance becomes ever more clear the more you attend to that guidance and you start dialoguing with it in the sense of I need to listen to this because it's not coming from my rational side. So this brings us back to mysticism. Guidance is not rational. There's nothing rational about an intuitive hit. I know I earned my living as a medical intuitive for how many how, decades and I know that with medical intuition there's nothing rational about someone like me who could help a physician like Norm Shuey with his patient in Missouri. And I, I was 
either in New Hampshire or back in Chicago. And I had to trust the downloads that I would get about these patients that he would call me uh, about who were in his office. And these downloads were, you know, not rational. I didn't see the person. I didn't talk to the person. And yet I would get impressions of their childhood or I'd get impressions of, of what they were, uh, of an illness they were developing. And um, that is how Norm and I worked together. But again, to me, this was a natural skill from the mystical realm. That was, there was nothing irrational about it. There was everything. This is normal. To me, it's totally normal because I don't align to the rational world as being the only plane of life. And I think what, what is at confronting people now is that the rational capacities in us are no longer sufficient to navigate the terrain of our lives, which have become very much involved in our inner world as much as our outer world. And that when you ask for questions about purpose and meaning, and your intuition is up and running, you have a deeper side of yourself that you could call the beginnings of mystical consciousness, not in a spiritual, religious sense, but in the sense that mystical consciousness expands your capacity to comprehend the texture of the moment that you're in. You can perceive as well as see. You can sense as well as hear. And you grab, you grab data that is some of it is from what you're looking at, so very grounded data. But you also rely on inner data that may not in the immediate moment have an external point that allows you to say, see, I know this is true because this is here. Intuition's not like that. Mysticism's not like that. Because your inner world is weight, has woken up and is functioning like that, the trying to combine inner experiences with rational parameters can be very, very difficult. If you don't recognize that some of these experiences may well require a different vocabulary, such as, I think I have, my consciousness is expanding to having timeless resources. You could call it that timeless resources. I'm, I'm sensing something that I need to pay attention to. And while you may not in the beginning think of this as like, is this a mystical experience? But it has all the threads of a mystical experience, which means an experience about the texture of what's in your life that is not rational, that is not rational. And it comes from guidance. Now, I'm not talking about hallucinations. I'm not talking about fantasies. I'm not talking about any. That's a whole other category, which I need to acknowledge and we'll leave it there because I was going to do the fantasies today, actually, but not yet. These types of experiences where you are asking and pursuing yourself, what am I doing here? What do I need to do? What, what am I feeling? What's going on? That take you deeper and deeper into yourself. Oftentimes, produce inner waves because you're getting to know yourself. You're on the journey of self-knowledge. And that journey of self-knowledge goes directly to the soul. Goes directly to your soul. And that's when you start having cravings for living a more authentic life. It's a natural progression. It's a natural progression. It's like, I need to be me. And you can feel, you can feel the ruptures 
from inside yourself. So while mystical experiences aren't, I'll tell none of you to expect angelic apparitions or anything like that, I will tell you that as you pursue yourself, what are you pursuing? You're pursuing the deeper resources in yourself, self-knowledge. You want to know who you are. You want to know why you are the way you are. And as you pursue that, that world opens up to deeper and deeper perceptions. Perceptions that create an appetite in you to be free of ordinary rational constraints. Like why I, your, your intuitive skills want to be heard and expressed. Um, you might find yourself craving creativity in a way you never did before or having ideas about it. You know, I just, I, why can't I be artistic or why can't I? Why can't I do this? Or, or you might find yourself becoming incredibly perceptive about wanting authentic conversation with people and authentic exchanges. And why I call this contemporary mysticism is because we move ourselves to the transcendent altitude in our lives. We, it's like you want to shed that, that the burdenous um, restrictions of what you have to do and what, what you restrict it to, to realizing that at the transcendent altitude, the choice to act on love, the choice to act through the heart, usually resolves things much better than the grit of the rational level, the grit of the rational level. These are, these are in collision. That the, the, the mystical response, that idea that there, you start seeing things from this altitude that instead of dividing and conquering, what would it look like if we worked all together? If we had a holistic view, mysticism follows the natural path of the design of life. So on that, I'm going to read this beautiful poem by, by Habes, who I, I just love. This is uh, Translations by Daniel Lindinsky. This is the great, greatest. But here's a touch. Because he was a Sufi mystic. Now is the time that all you do is sacred. Now is the time to know that all you do is sacred. Now why not consider a lasting truce between yourself and God? Now is the time to understand that all your ideas of right and wrong were just a child's training wheels to be laid aside when you finally live with veracity and love. Havas is a divine envoy whom the beloved has written a holy message upon. My dear, please tell me, why do you still throw sticks at your heart and God? What is it in that sweet voice inside that incites you to fear? Now is the time for the world to know that every thought and action is sacred. This is the time for you to compute the impossibility that there is anything but grace. Now is the season to know that everything you do is sacred. I adore that. That is the mystic's position. That is... It, Think about, what if you just, in the midst of the worst moment, said, what if I looked at this as if everything's sacred? How would I then respond? How would I then respond? What if I thought that I was flanked by holy guidance? What would I ask for? Try that out. Okay, everybody. Thank you.